Okay, welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third Manchester in Translation. Um, my name is Sarah Cleave. I'm the publishing manager at Comma Press, um, and we are an independent publisher in Manchester specialising in short stories and fiction in translation. Um, so this mini festival um, of talks and various translation workshops is part of a wider series of events taking place across the city to celebrate International Mother Language Day. Um, so if any of this is of interest, um, you can find out more um, about the rest of the programme on the Manchester City of Literature website. Um, but to kick off, our festival, um, Manchester in Translation, um, we are incredibly lucky to have a keynote talk by Lawrence Schimmel, who is joining us today from Madrid. Um, so probably not currently being battered by various storms in the same way that we are. <laughs> um, so Lawrence um, doesn't need much of an introduction. He is a prolific and award-winning writer um, working across a range of different genres, including poetry, graphic novels and children's literature. Um, he is also a publisher in his own right and also a voracious reader. So he is perfectly placed to give us lots of juicy insights into every aspect of the publishing process, as well as being published in translation. Um, so before I hand over to Lawrence, um, I will say that there's gonna be time for all of your questions at the end. Um, so if you've got anything to ask um, as we go through, then please just add it into the chat on YouTube and then I'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so without further ado, ado, <laughs> um, welcome Lawrence um, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's, um, it was a delight to be invited to, to give the keynote. I also, um, as I joked to my father, uh, when I was invited, I said, my imposter syndrome is getting, he's having a really tough time now. Um, you know, this was uh, earlier in the year when I was invited and I had uh, a few books that had just uh, been selected for some best of the year award. So it was sort of one of those uh, strange moments that, um, that, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome, which I still have after all these years, I'm 50 now. Um, and this is sort of one of the things when I was thinking about, you know, what can I offer in terms of experience that would be useful to emerging translators um, today, since so much has changed since I started. But um, I'm going to talk about my own experience and hopefully um, there will be lots of stuff that can be relevant um, today for translators, whether emerging or less emerging, um, and also for writers and for um, people who are multilingual creators. I mean, especially since um, we're celebrating the Mother Tongue Day, um, and I happen to write in both English and Spanish. I don't know whether um, whether we mentioned that yet. So I'm originally from New York. I've been living in Spain for over 20 years now. Um, I write primarily in English and Spanish. I've self-translated myself uh, also into Catalan and Galician, and I've occasionally written um, some poetry in German and stuff. So. Um, Basically, that just means I'm shameless. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it, the experience of creating across languages and how that, um, and my translation work and how also being translated um, has affected my translation work is sort of um, the overall thing of what I'd like to talk about. Although I'm going to, you know, I apologize in advance. I never, I have lots of notes and I never follow them. And this is sort of one of the differences between um, creating a text and being able to cut and paste it before it goes to an audience. And when I talk live, I've had to come to terms with this, that um, I, I go off on tangents all the time and that's just how my brain works. Um, that's sort of also how I've managed to be as prolific as I am. Um, you know, I did some number crunching before. So I always used to think of myself as a writer who also translates. Um, last year, or I guess two years ago now, at the beginning of the pandemic, I did an event with uh, Danny Han. And um, before that, I actually did some research and found out that my first book translations came out before my first uh, book of my own. So um, even though I was writing before I began translating, my publishing history is the opposite, where I started publishing translations in book form, at least not in, in uh, journals or anthologies. But, um, you know, books were, were um, my translated books were, published first. Um, I've published over, I think, 120 books, including the anthologies that I've edited. And um, that's as an author or as a 
uh, anthologist. Um, and yesterday I was going through, um, you know, my shelves and uh, my, uh, my uh, records on my computer and stuff. And it seems that I've translated over 130 books. So that was a little helpful for also, you know, like getting over my imposter syndrome. Can I give this uh, keynote speech? Will it be relevant to people and things like that? I think one of the big things with the imposter syndrome, um, but also this is a reason why uh, in particular, this Comma Press sponsored event is, is important to me is I'm a non-novelist. So with all of the books I've done, um, I've never written a novel and technically I may not have translated one yet. So um, looking over what I've translated, um, the, so, you know, surprisingly or less surprisingly, I've translated 51 picture books that includes in both directions, but doesn't include any of my own books that I've translated from one language to another. 45 books of poetry, uh, 12 graphic novels, nine middle grade or young adult books, nine books of essays, and then two novellas. Um, I call them novellas. Um, you know, this La Bastarda is um, the first book by a woman writer from Equatorial Guinea that I translated into English for the feminist press in the States or for Mojadi books in uh, South Africa, um, but it's a very slender book. So a lot of people would call it a novella rather than a novel. And I think that there's so much um, prejudice in the literary community very often against anything that's not the novel, that the novel is seen as the only legitimate form. Um, a lot of this goes back to, um, you know, sort of how canons are, are created and who's allowed in them or not, and who's trying to exclude from them and different things like that. But um, just to this again also, I was going to do more introduction first and then jump into things. I get, I will be getting distracted constantly. So I've published as a writer, four collections of short stories. Um, the first was a collection of LGBT uh, fantasy stories called The Drag Queen of Elfland. This is the first Spanish edition, which was called Mi Novia Son Duende. I did not do the translation into Spanish. And curiously, um, the book is currently being retranslated into Spanish um, in a new edition. This was published in Spain. So there's a new Latin American translation that's being done right now in Argentina. Um, and I, you know, just out of curiosity, I asked um, my editor how old the translator was and he's younger than the book. So this book was published in, uh, I think in 1997. Um, and the translator was born after that. So for him, it's actually historical fiction aside from that. So um, my second collection was a book called His Tongue, uh, which is erotic uh, gay fiction. Curiously though, um, even though it was written in English, it was, not, it was published first in Spanish. And so um, Bien Dotado was the original printing and then um, it was republished. Uh, in another publisher after he got it out of print. Um, my third collection, uh, Two Boys in Love, is romantic uh, LGBT fiction. And then there was a gap of 15 years um, until I published my fourth collection, which was the first collection of adult fiction that I wrote directly in Spanish. And it's in a, a collection of 100 erotic microfiction. So I tried to see, um, you know, can we portray the erotic in the compressed um, format of the, of the microfiction. Um, so, you know, short stories for me is something I've always been very comfortable with um, as a writer, um, also as a translator. And I think this is also something that, um, you know, leaping into things that can hopefully be useful to translators emerging or not. Um, when you're translating, you know, very often you might start with a short story, you might get asked to write a short or to translate a short story, things like that. But it's important, I think, for translators to think um, like publishers or also to know how the publishing industry works and to try and figure out how you can not just um, translate the story, but maybe figure out ways to either do a collection by the same author or work to um, find a grouping of stories that can work thematically to become an anthology, you know, and these are ways of um, strategizing uh, what you're going to be working on or how you decide what to work on um, that I would encourage translators to, um, to think about more. Um, and I think that one thing that happens a lot with translators, especially um, beginning 
career translators is we get so focused on, you know, we found a book that we've fallen in love with and we want to translate it. And we get so focused on that one book. Um, and there's a few things that happen as a result of that. So um, one is that we don't think about possible reprints. And I think it's really important for um, translators to understand how publishing works and what rights are involved and for them to hold on to as many rights as possible. So, I mean, the way publishing works, publishers will always ask for all rights if they can get away with it. Um, so translators should try and keep as many rights as possible or make sure that rights revert to them um, when the publisher has ceased to exploit the work. So, um, you know, there are some people who don't love the publishing industry and are not as actively involved in it as I am, where I, I sort of love um, lots of the stuff about it and the, the sort of matchmaking and um, sort of the Jewish mother in me that loves matchmaking, even not my own books, but you know, if I know someone's working on a project and I know that someone else would like that particular project and you know, that sort of matchmaking. So um, not a good agent, but a good matchmaker. So that's a slightly different thing. But that's the other thing about, um, you know, having, finding that book that you want for as an early career translator um, and figuring out how to pitch it so one thing that I think is also really important for translators to realize is that the pitch is not so much about the project, but about the editorial relationship. And so when you're pitching projects to an editor, what you're doing is getting to know one another's taste. And so the, the more you, you know, these are things that only happen over time. And the more you get to know each other, then the better able you will be able to pitch projects that might be of interest to that particular editor. Um, and those things may also change over time. So an editor who, was looking for something, they may move to a different house and be looking for different things, or the, the direction that they're going in may also um, change and evolve over time. And what you're interested in will also change and evolve over time. I mean, um, I've translated quite a lot. Um, I also, you know, aside from the books, lots of technical translations or, or extracts of things that I've been commissioned to do. Um, certainly, I think that um, in the beginning, it's really good to try lots of different things um, because that's one way you know sort of what your interests are. And so, um, you know, the other thing is, you know, like I know when we, we signed the mortgage to this apartment, I accepted everything that came my way that year. It was far too much and um, was not a healthy, uh, a healthy thing personally or mentally to, you know, the pressure of having a, a mortgage was was um, difficult, you know, as a full time freelancer for me to handle. Um, but you know, we we the, you know with translation, translation has there is an art to translation, but it's also a skill and a craft. And um, the same with publishing, you know, writing. Um, publishing is a business, and so as part of the business, we should get a fair share out of any of the use of our work, whether it's a writing or a translation. And so one of the awkward things with translation also is that translation is a subsidiary copyright. So um, let's say, well, we can, we can have a good uh, example using some of my own work. Um, so this is the uh, original Spanish edition of my work, which is licensed to the Spanish publisher for a set number of years. Um, this is the uh, Slovenian translation of the book, which was uh, translated by uh, Barbara Prego. And um, so in this case, there's a license, uh, in this case, between me and the Slovenian publisher, there's a separate license between the Slovenian publisher and Barbara. Um, but Barbara, for instance, couldn't publish uh, the translation outside of that contract without also getting my permission, um, if that makes sense. So. Um, I do think it's important for, you know, this is also one of the reasons about asking or reminding publish, uh, translators to keep as many rights as possible or make sure the rights come back to them. So um, very often when a publisher licenses a translation, it's for a set amount of time. And after that time, they can either renew it or decide to, um, to stop publishing it, at which point um, another publisher can step in. Um, they may contact you again to license the translation again for you. Um, but with the way the trans uh, technology has been evolving so quickly, um, lots of times there may be rights that were not exploited by the original publisher. So, uh, for instance, I had um, over the years, for instance, these books, um, let's see, this and this and a number of anthologies I had done had all been published in German translation. 
but back in the, the 90s and the 2000s when there weren't ebooks. And so uh, a couple of years ago, a German publisher uh, licensed German language ebook rights to a lot of my backlist, but and was able to do that because I was in touch with my translators and they were able to come to an agreement with them where, you know, for a much smaller advance than we gotten the first time, but it was a way of um, getting additional revenue out of um, this work that otherwise was not being exploited by anyone. So, you know, the same thing might happen where let's say you translate a novel for a company and it goes out of print and the publisher never didn't eat an audiobook, let's say. So you can either work with the author directly or their agent um, and decide to make an audiobook happen or relicense them um, outside of that. So um, knowing what the rights are, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do the negotiating or controlling yourself, but you know, know that um, who controls what is also very important. And it doesn't even have to be the same for every, you know, you can have multiple experiences with the same publishers where the right situation is very different. Um, you get a, a sip. This is one of those weird things about these online things where I'm used to talking and seeing the people who I'm talking with and seeing if they're reacting and how they're, uh, if I'm talking too fast, if they're understanding things, whatever. So, um, but I will forge ahead. Um, just to give an example. So, um, with this project, um, which I had found because I know the, uh, the original Spanish publisher um, and I talked to them about you know, pitching it. So um, before it was picked up by the feminist press, I had um, offered a, an extract to Word Without Borders. And since we knew that we were going to be trying to place the entire collection elsewhere, we kept the reprint rights to the translation directly. Um, there was another, Oops, there was another piece that I translated for uh, Words Without Borders, which is a poem by a, um, a Colombian indigenous writer named Freddy Chican Chicangana. Um, and this anthology from Copper Canyon asked to reprint it and they came to me directly. But in this case, I didn't have contact with Freddy directly. That was something which Words Without Borders had sourced. They had asked me to do the translation and in the contract, they were the ones who would negotiate on behalf of Freddie, myself, and Words Without Borders, any reprint rights and things like that. And so um, I, I sent the editors to uh, my contact at Words Without Borders, and they negotiated on our behalf. And you know, then we get um, our copies and share of the revenues that were generated of, of this stuff later on. So um, you know, I'm not saying that all translators need to keep everything themselves, but things should either, you know, you should know how things are handled or who handles what. Um, you should keep as much as you can, I think is always uh, the best thing. Um, and make sure that things revert to you when the publisher stops um, using them. So that, um, you know, as I'm in my 50s now, as you know, I'm 50 now, um, things happen like uh, my very first short story collection, um, getting a, an entirely new Spanish translation uh, 20 something years later. You know, I mean, it's sort of um, books very often can have a long life um, differently than what, you know, rather than just thinking of that first publication, whether it's that first publication as an author or as a translator, um, you never know what's going to happen. So it's always good to be able to control as much as possible. Um, when I first arrived in Spain, I was sort of, um, I guess maybe backing up a little bit more to why I speak Spanish, how I speak Spanish, um, things like that. So um, I grew up in New York. Um, both of my parents worked and my parents had, um, for a long time, they were helping various Central American uh, people to get their papers in the States. And um, then they would go off and um, have other employment. And meanwhile, usually a cousin would come and those people were taking care of my sister and me while my parents were working and out of the house all day. So I spoke Spanish growing up, even though it wasn't a family language, um, it was my domestic language to speak Spanish. Um, one thing my parents learned they had at one point started to buy um, what they call white label. Um, so sort of the generic brand that doesn't have a picture on it. Um, and we learned that uh, a number of the, the people who were taking care of my sister and me were um, analphabet illiterate. 
um, that if it didn't have a picture of carrots or peas on the can, they didn't know until they opened the can what was in it, even though um, in the US at least, many of the white label brands are in both English and Spanish. So um, I spoke Spanish um, at the home. When I started um, in school, I started taking Latin and then I doubled to take um, Homeric Greek. And then I finally added a third language. And I think I dropped Greek at that point and, and added, um, added Spanish as my second language. Um, because I spoke fluently, I was actually pushed through. And so I'm, I'm missing a year of grammar. So I, I had my first and second year of grammar, but because I was fairly fluent in terms of speaking, which is a big problem for a lot of Americans, I was pushed into fourth year, which was conversation. So I have a huge gap in my grammatical um, basis. And actually, you know, until I learned Latin, I didn't really have a good grasp of grammar, even in English. We didn't, uh, you know, the American system where I was studying didn't have, didn't teach us uh, that. And so, you know, learning foreign languages was how I, you know, learned grammar in terms of English. So in many ways, um, also my mother had studied Spanish, um, spent time abroad during the late Franco period here in Spain. Um, and at the time my father didn't speak Spanish. So in many ways, Spanish at home was a mother tongue that at the dinner table, I could say something to my mother or vice versa that my father wouldn't understand. So it was, it's, you know, I jokingly call Spanish my stepmother tongue, um, but it was a, a sub mother tongue. Um, I never learned, unfortunately, um, Yiddish, which um, my father's side of the family spoke. Um, so that's a, another lacuna that I have. Um, when I first moved to Spain though, even though I was speaking Spanish, um, I wasn't sure if I was actually thinking in Spanish or if I was thinking in English and translating the thought before I finished it. And so, um, you know, I moved here in January of 99. In March, I actually wrote a poem, which I've never published. I don't know that it's a very good poem, um, but it had a title that was very meaningful and important because it was the first time that I realized I had written something autochthonously in Spanish, that I was not translating from Anglophone thought into Spanish because it's something that's untranslatable in English. So um, in English, we have one concept, which is round trip. Um, that's a single concept. In Spanish, it's ida y vuelta, the journey and the return. And I had um, written a poem called Sida y vuelta. So Sida is AIDS, the acronym is um, done separately. So it was, um, using the metaphor of a flight to talk about HIV. And um, so for me, it was, it was a, a breakthrough moment that I was actually writing something in Spanish that was truly written in Spanish that I wasn't even translating in my head from an, you know, uh, an Anglophone thought and translating it as, I, you know, with something that was actually written in Spanish. And so um, this was something that, that comes up. So you know, as I mentioned, I translate in both directions, both um, primarily between English and Spanish. I do play around sometimes with with some other um, some other languages, especially if I'm working directly with the with the authors. So um, the the first time that I had, you know, so I guess also part of how I fell into translation, I, I fell into it. So, I mean, and this is one of the things I think I mentioned earlier, but um, one of the reasons I'm, I also have this imposter syndrome about giving a keynote or, or giving these sort of talks, I have lots of experience. I don't have any pedagogy or any, um, I don't know, academic theory or anything like that to back up stuff. I have lots of experience sort of in the trenches. And that's sort of, you know, as I was starting to say with, you know, um, I started in science fiction, I started writing, um, you know, in the trenches in, uh, for the genre magazines for, uh, or actually more for anthologies than for the magazines. And I guess that's something to talk about also. But I think that that was something that helped me pitch. So, I mean, I sort of really learned uh, back when I was starting out in the late eighties, um, actually. So I've been in publishing, you know, I, I first started selling professionally um, since the late 80s. I was under 18, my parents had to sign the contracts of the first um, publications that I made. So 
um, you know, that was also the other thing I was like, well, what, what do I know that's relevant now to people who are just starting? But um, in the science fiction field, they had um, sort of what they consider professional publication and then you had semi-pro or, or fanzines. And so, you know, it was a sort of a goal to, to crack the, the professional threshold. So right away for me, you know, breaking into certain markets and getting paid a professional rate for the work that you're doing was something that was um, part of the whole system or the whole ethos of what I grew up or, or the, the, the writing publishing world that I sort of grew up in. in. Um, because I was, I found it so much better or easier for me to focus or to write when I was writing something specifically to an anthology. And this was something that, um, because I, I could play with the expectations of the reader. So um, I knew, for instance, let's say there was an anthology of killer dog stories. I loved playing against expectations. So I might write a story about a puppy who digs a hole and someone falls and trips and breaks their head open. Technically, it's a killer dog story. It's not what you would think would be in a book called Killer Dog Stories. Um, and I used to love doing that. In science fiction, because the writers get paid by the word, most of the professional writers write really long stories. And so I started or I got my foothold by writing um, often very lighthearted pieces that were very short. Um, and for anthologists, this was useful because it let them balance the book. And so, um, you know, it was advantageous for an anthologist if they had suddenly, you know, seven pieces that were 25 pages long, having a three page piece gave them a little more balance. Um, and it also was easier to, in the budget to find room in the budget to add in this extra story. So um, one of the things though about books, you know, even mass market anthologies, which is what I was mostly writing for, the circulation was much lower than the magazines. Um, you know, if you had written for Isaac Asimov Science Fiction or the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction at the time, you know, they had circulations of over 50,000, whereas an anthology, something like this, would have a first printing of 5,000. So it was a much smaller audience, actually. Um, but, you know, my heart was in anthologies and, you know, I was writing specifically for um, lots and lots of them. And, you know, it's something that I, I love doing. And I think, though, that that experience helped with how I'm able to pitch or my understanding of pitching and this, this sort of long-term uh, career overview, which is what I um, am hoping to instill in all translators, whether emerging or not, to think big picture rather than just making the one sale and then it's over. You know what I mean? A lot of times um, I've found that books or, or pieces can be sold and resold and resold. And certainly, you know, with the, the, my early short story collections, that was something that was um, very much the case, um, especially with the, um, you know, in parallel to the science fiction stuff that I was writing, um, I was also writing a lot of erotica. Um, you can call it erotica, you can call it porn. Uh, a lot of that to me is just a class distinction about, and also, where it's being published. And, you know, this goes back to expectations. Very often the same piece that I would write for um, a skin magazine or, or originally published in a skin magazine when it's published in, an, in a book, it suddenly goes from being porn if there are dirty pictures in the book, in the magazine, to erotica if it's in a book and the book is in a bookstore, which is sort of this cis-heteronormative space. Um, even if I haven't changed a comma um, in, the, in the stories. Um, for me, the writing erotica was very important because it was one of the ways that I, as a young gay man, could write to a gay audience without going through um, the heteronormative gaze. So that was one of the few places that I found to, um, to be able to write, you know, as a gay man to my tribe. And this whole idea of, of you know, sort of who we're writing for and what, um, you know, it, it also is very important for translators. And I think that, um, um, just to give an example again, if you take a book like uh, The Dry Queen of Elfland, so these are all LGBT fantasy stories, um, there are four possible audiences that you can be writing for. You can write for um, a fantasy audience, in which case you would take for granted that they understand all the fantasy terminology and you would explain 
the LGBT subculture terms, you can write for an LGBT audience, um, in which case you would uh, explain the fantasy stuff, but you could take for granted that they would know a term like butch femme, let's say. You could write for my parents and you would explain both the fantasy and the LGBT subculture, or you can write for um, LGBT geeks. Um, so those are four possible audiences. And I think that when we're translating, this is also something that uh, it's important for us to think about who we're translating for. And um, you know, this is stuff to negotiate with your editors, but also that um, we as translators, you know, I think it's important for us as translators to recreate the reading experience. And so we have, we're, we're guided in many ways by the original text, but there's also lots of stuff that we as translators can have our own agendas, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm co-translating a book right now with um, Leila Benitez James. And this was a project that um, came up a few years ago where um, I figured one of the ways to try and help uh, affect change in the field and create more possibilities um, for translators of color was to offer a sort of um, mentorship, even though it didn't have any sort of official structure. And I think this is something that comes out of my experience in the science fiction world where um, a lot of the professionals would help uh, the semi-professionals get better at their craft and find opportunities and things like that. And what you were supposed to do was to pay it forward. That is, the professionals who were already established didn't need you to help them. And you sort of had an obligation to help the next generation. So um, I had uh, been in touch with Layla about, um, she had interviewed me for Asymptote for a piece about uh, a, a podcast series that she was doing on translating blackness. And um, uh, there was a project about a mixed race um, woman whose mother is Spanish and father is Ecuadorian Guinean, and I wanted to translate it, and I thought this would be a good project to um, to do this sort of mentorship work, and so we're doing it. Anyway, in, in the first draft when we were doing the, um, the a sample for a publisher, um, I had put in the first draft, I had translated hijos prodigios um, as prodigal children, and she had changed it to prodigal sons, and I said, no, we as translators can be more um, we can have an agenda ourselves. That is, we don't have to use the masculine as the neutral. Um, and that was something that to her was just an illumination. Um, and so, um, and I forget how I got onto that, about the different ways of who we're translating for. Um, I think that there's a tendency, especially in fiction translation into English to assume that the reader knows nothing. Um, and this is something that, especially since I'm translating from Spanish, there's a lot of hybridity in the, especially in the US of, you know, Spanish, English and Spanglish and Hispanic culture. Um, and there isn't, you know, necessarily a, a full divide. And very often um, a lot of the types of writers I'm, I'm translating also use um, Spanglish or mixed things. And, you, you know, for me, it's important to recreate that. So you don't, uh, you know, if things are already in English in the original, you leave those in English and then you would leave other things in Spanish to recreate that texture sort of thing. But um, you know, I think that there's a presumption that everything in a translation needs to be glossed and fully explained in a way that original fiction that's written in English is not held to those same standards. And so um, I fight against that uh, over explanation of everything when I can, um, you know, you need to do enough, um, you know, it, it comes down, I guess, to, to treating the reader intelligently and, and respecting their intelligence. And so rather than dumbing down everything, um, you know, I think that we as translators can, can choose um, and can, can fight to create more space to, um, to allow a lot of those hybridities or other things, or, you know, not to italicize uh, terms or foods or things like that. You know, there's a double standard about what gets explained and what gets left um, depending on, on where, where they're from. <sighs> um, I definitely write differently in each of the languages that I write in. And I write, um, you know, for instance, I'm, I've been in Spain for over 20 years now. So I write about Spain very differently in English than in Spanish in part because I can take for granted knowledge, you know. If I'm writing in English about Spain, uh, something like the term merienda, which is a snack between lunch and dinner time, um, 
in Spanish, I don't need to explain what the Miriam is, I just mention it. And in English, I have to explain what that is, especially um, you know, in the English speaking world, many places have had dinner already by four or five, uh, <laughs> whereas this you know, 6, 6.30 p.m. snack until dinner time, which is after nine, needs context very often, or I can't take for granted that the audience will necessarily understand it. Um, I also found that as a poet, being able to write in Spanish gave me much more specificity. That is in Spanish, we use tu for the intimate singular you, usted for the formal singular you, uh, vosotros and ustedes for the plurals. Um, so I was able to write poetry um, with much more specificity in, in Spanish than I am in English. And um, one other way that translation has really uh, affected, I was at a poetry translation workshop in Slovenia a number of years ago and um, learned that Slovenian has this dual uh, that we don't have in either English or Spanish. But ever since I learned about this, I'm always aware now if my we's are an intimate we, this dual we, the you and I we, different from a three or more we. And so having learned about that when one of my own poems was being translated into Slovenian really um, blew my mind and made a huge difference in terms of um, how I write and also how I translate. And so this also happened, um, I, I did a, you know, I, as you can see, I have lots of books around me, but um, I uh, unfortunately didn't bring one of the books that I wanted to talk about. So the first book of mine that I wrote in Spanish that was translated into English by someone else is a children's picture book called originally Vamos a ver a papá. And in English, it was translated as Let's Go See Papá, translated by Elisa Mado and published by Groundwood. Um, I didn't find out that the book was sold until it had already been, you know, it had been sold by the publisher and it was already translated when I found out that the deal had been made. So uh, it was sort of a done deal. They did show me the, the translation. Um, my one thing they'd originally used, let's go see daddy. And the story is about um, a girl in Latin America. And instead of telling the story of coming to a new country, it tells the story of the people who are left behind. So it's a girl whose father is working in other countries, sending money home. There's a story of the girl, the grandmother, the mother and the grandmother in the absence of her father. And I said, it really needs to be Papa. It shouldn't be daddy. And um, I said, I'll accept everything else in the translation. I would have done lots of things different, including um, translating the title instead of let's go see Papa. I would have said, we're going to see Papa. Les vamos a ver a Papa. Um, but, you know, I said, uh, you know what your market's like. And, um, you know, this experience was really useful for me in terms of giving me much more confidence in my own writing in Spanish. And I also started translating into Spanish a lot more once someone had decided that my Spanish was good enough to translate into English with as hard as it is to translate anything into English. So that was one uh, way that, you know, moving between my, my mother tongue and my stepmother tongue, how that affects my translation. Um, this also happened most recently with the uh, adult collection that I mentioned. So um, this book has been completely translated into English by Sandra Kingery. Um, and it's been fascinating the whole process um, for lots of different reasons. One of which was um, I learned to step back and just be the author. Um, and let her make decisions and let her make decisions that would be very different from how I would do it. And that also gave me much more assurance for when I'm translating other writers that I'm the translator, this is my translation, a different translator would do a different thing. But um, you know, unless there are things that are uh, mistakes or you know, lacks of understandings or different things like that, um, you know, it, being translated into English allowed me to feel much more or defend better my decisions and my, you know, quirks and peculiarities and different things like that. Um, my father joked when uh, when I told him that the book was being translated into English and said, congratulations son, but you know, what does this woman know about gay sex that you don't know when you're a professional translator, this is how you make a living is translating other writers into English. And so, um, you know, I laughed. It was actually, it's, it's curious that, um, you know, Barbara Pregel who did the translation into Slovenian uh, also a, a female identified translator and definitely in English, um, the fact that a woman translator had done the translation 
gave it a patina of respectability. It was literature and translation that just happened to be about gay sex, whereas if I had self-translated it, it would have just been porn. Um, so Sandra was able to place a lot of the stories in um, literary journals that would be much more respectable or would not otherwise be interested necessarily in um, gay sex stories than if I had either written it or self-translated. So that was something that was fascinating to see how that, um, that experience uh, affected things. Working with Sandra on the translation, you know, going over things and answering her queries and stuff, very few of her queries or, or things actually was about the sexual vocabulary. Now, um, I'll get back to, to sex stuff in a, in a minute, but, um, you know, most of the stuff was figuring out things like how to transmit uh, Spanish cultural references or things like that. You know, one of the stories uh, involves, or it, it takes place in a vestibulo, which Spanish apartments very often have. When you come through the main door, there's a tiny little, um, it's not a cloak room, it's not a mud room, it's, you know, and it's not a vestibule, which is usually like coming into a bigger building. So, you know, that was something we had to figure out how to do that. It was also amazing to see, because um, I think that sex and humor and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, joking with my father, I've inherited his, his sense of humor and that comes out a lot, I think, in, in my own writing. It was great to see Sandra's solutions to um, some of the double entendres, things I would never have thought of that were just so perfect and so brilliant um, in her translation that, you know, that was definitely a reason why having someone else translate the book uh, rather than my having self-translated enriched the, the process so much. Um, just also another example of something that I, I happen to just love uh, a translation of. So I wrote uh, two board books. Uh, let's see, this is No es de Jugar and Pronto por la Mañana. So these are books um, that I wrote in Spanish in rhyme. Um, the English translations were published with the titles uh, Bedtime Not Playtime and uh, Early One Morning. So, uh, but literally it's not, it's not time for play. The German translation, however, uses the term Hundemude, which I think is just so brilliant. That would be dog tired and dog tired would have been a perfect translation for this book. Um, so, <sighs> Let me just see what, what I haven't gotten to yet before we start getting to some of the, the, um, the Q&A. This is sort of the things also where I have my notes, I never follow them. There's lots of possible things to talk about. Um, so I would also, I guess, the other thing to think about um, when you're thinking about where to publish things as translators or where to pitch stuff, um, Focus not just on who's only open to translations, but also make sure that the work is right for that uh, editor or house or magazine or anything like that. So um, just to briefly, you know, as Sarah mentioned, I run a poetry publishing house called the Midsummer Night's Press. And we happen to have an imprint that I started in 2014 that only publishes women poets in translation um, that I started when um, they did number crunching and saw, saw that everything published in the US fiction, poetry, nonfiction from all languages, only 26% were by women writers. And I said, okay, I've got a press, I can try and do something to change this. As a result though, um, you know, the Periscope uh, imprint gets queries from a lot of um, translators. And a lot of times it's just, oh, you publish women poets, here's this women poet that I've been translating. Very often the work is not um, a good fit for us. Um, my taste is very clear in pretty much everything that we do. I'm much more, uh, I lean towards more narrative poetry rather than more experimental work. So very often, you know, someone will send me this experimental translation from a very interesting writer. Um, and I'll be like, you know, talk to Nightboat or talk to Ugly Duckling, you know, we're not the right press for this. And um, it, it wouldn't be right for us to publish even something I like if I'm not gonna be able to bring that to a audience. And I think that you know, the audience that the press has knows, you know, also I'm able to find people who like that shape of poetry and more narrative shaped poetry. 
So, but there was one poet who sent me a, a, a pitch from an interesting working class writer from Israel. And I said, you know, I like the translations. They're not right for us. Try going to working class, you know, presses that focus on class struggle and things like that. Even if they're not generally open to translations, thematically, it's a better fit for that. Um, the same can hold true, you know, I had translated a collection by a Spanish writer, Cari Santos, and um, there was an anthology of poems about ice cream, and they weren't open, you know, they, they didn't say they were looking for translations or anything like that, but I said, Cari, do you happen to have any ice cream poems? And she had a poem, and uh, I translated it, and we sent it in, and, uh, and it was accepted. So, you know, I mean, a lot of times, um, you don't only have to submit translations to publishers that are known for translations, you know, as long as um, thematically or the underlying whatever it is of the work um, is a good fit. Uh, this is something that came up a lot also with the, the anthology. So like, this is an anthology I did for uh, Camelot Fantastic. Um, I had done an, the first uh, fantasy anthology I did was called Tarot Fantastic. And um, interestingly, it, it has three queer uh, stories and three queer contributors, but the queer stories were not by the queer contributors. That they had always been asked to, to be the token queer writer in the other anthologies they had been contributing to, and I didn't ask that. But the non queer writers said, "We knew that you would be open to these stories, and we never felt comfortable finding some place to to write for them before." So we're ready for the Q and A. I hope yeah. this is <laughs> interesting, been... people, and useful. <laughs> It's been incredibly interesting, Lawrence. Thanks so much for sharing so much with us, actually. Um, your journey and kind of like how people um, can work with publishers um, and authors. Um, well, actually, I thought I'd start there um, just to kick things off, just kind of asking if you could talk a little bit more about your own translation process um, and also kind of like how, as a translator, you work with... I'm so sorry. Um, how you work with... Um, publishers and authors and other translators as well because you said that some projects you've worked on you've co-translated and that to me is incredibly intriguing um, yeah because I'm not entirely sure how, how it works um, on those projects. Okay um, that's a lot of different questions <laughs> so I can jump in um, you know I do think it's really important for translators to um, network with one another that's something that's very useful and I mean it's certainly also in a lot of you know in a conference like this or you know, any other conference in person, very often attendees are focused on like, I must try and talk to that editor and, and pitch them a book or things like that. And very often I find that making um, connections with your colleagues can be much more rewarding. And very often we share information amongst each other or, you know, I may have pitched to someone and they didn't like that, but as I've learned to their tastes, then I can be able to say, ah, you know, you should send this to so-and-so because I know that, you know, she's got a particular interest in whatever it is that's in the manuscript or stuff. Also very often, um, you know I mean? I do a lot of um, children's book translations and a lot of times I will be asked by publishers, you know, we've just bought something um, from Turkey or from Korea. Do you know a translator who, who can work with children's? Because not everything is the right, um, the right uh, project for the right, you know, for not every translator can do certain types of things. This is actually something where um, I remember years ago, a big New York publishing house uh, and the editor asked me to translate this young adult book about soccer. And I said, look, I know you're gonna pay a decent rate. Um, I loathe soccer. I don't know anything about soccer you know, or football in the UK. Um, and I said, I have friends who are hooligans and are professional translators and they will, you know, they have all this vocabulary and they'll do a great job. And, you know, and instead of losing a connection or a contact by, you know, telling an editor that I'm not the right translator for something and I put her in touch with someone to do the book who was a much better match. Um, our editorial uh, translator relationship was much better and she found a project that was perfect for me, which was translating into Spanish, a rhyming book about colors, um, which had all these other complications, you know, that she wanted all of the colors to be in the singular masculine. Um, you know, and I had a great time translating that into Spanish instead of translating into English this football book um, that I would have had a miserable time uh, doing, even though I've since just translated three picture books, two into Spanish and one into English about football. So it does happen. Um, but, you know, it, there were other reasons why I was the right translator for those projects different than, mm. you know, 
committing to this first book in an ongoing series. And um, I think also okay. it's important to, you know, you ask about the relationship with editors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, certainly in children's books, I'm, or, and even with adult titles, I'm, you know, and I think this is also when I tell translators to think like a publishing, you know, to understand how publishing works and be able to, to talk about things. You know, I'm constantly flagging, these are potential issues. Um, how should we resolve things? You know, I, I recently translated a memoir, um, a boy from Andorra who was born without his forearm. And in Spanish, we have the term manco, which means missing one hand. And in English, we don't have that. So when, when I was writing the reader's report, I said, this is something that's going to come up. This is one way of getting around it. You know, and we decided to use the Spanish term and gloss it the first time. And that was okay, but it was something that needed to be uh, addressed or brought up to the attention, I thought. Definitely. There has actually been quite a lot of um, questions as well about children's books in particular, because obviously it is a huge market in the UK, but I think we've been quite slow to, to translate lots of children's books. Um, so there's questions about kind of how, you know, how you would get into this field um, and if you've got any kind of advice for emerging children's um, translators um, and how they demonstrate their ability to translate um, in the first instance for this type of work. I would suggest that um, the World Kitlet platform um, is, they have a wonderful resource page and they have a lot of advice on how to wind up getting involved or starting in Kitlet translations. I think also one thing that um, I haven't yet mentioned but this is also something that that came up about you know my translating and my writing. Very often, you know, or, or translators can talk to um, target language publishers of who they're pitching to, but they can also talk to source language publishers. Some of whom will need um, samples commissioned for uh, you know taking books to the Bologna Book Fair if they're children's books, or the Frankfurt Book Fair, or even to the London Book Fair, um, which is coming up soon. Um, so that's another way um, of, you know, also it's important before you translate a book to make sure who has the rights, if the rights have been sold, if another translator is already working on it, things like that. So you kind of need to find out what the status of the book is before you start. So, you know, that getting used to talking in both directions or thinking, uh, not only thinking of, um, you know, must network with, um, in, you know, so I would, I would say that the World Kidlet uh, platform is a, you know, really useful way of um, getting more resources about, you know, finding out how to start um, and particularly how to start in children's books. Brilliant, that's really helpful. Um, and you spoke a lot as well about how, you know, how you choose, choose your, your projects and also kind of like how you see certain things that you do, how you can affect change within the industry as well. Um, would you necessarily say, um, you know, Calling yourself as an activist, do you think kind of the art of translation can be kind of disruptive um, in itself? Or how do you, yeah, if you could speak a little I bit? Yes, to both of those. I mean, so, you know, I mentioned the project that I'm doing with Leila, and, um, you know, even though the mentorship, I am a more experienced translator having published 130 books tr translated, and she has published in journals, but not yet done a book. Um, but there's lots of stuff that, um, you know, the, the mentorship has been working both ways, which has been wonderful. And one thing, you know, um, she gets me out of some of my ruts or, or things and um, which is great. And, you know, she was the one who suggested uh, that we apply for an NEA grant, which we won. So that was amazing. Um, that project that was part of a, a long-term commitment of mine of um, the stuff I get asked to do for publishers and the stuff that I pitch, um, you know, I'm never asked to translate writers of color. And, you know, the same way that I started this imprint to try and translate more women's voices that uh, into English, we're missing um, women, women writers being translated. So all of these are, are poets who have had at least two books published in their country. So they're not a one hit wonder, but it never had a book published in English translation until we published them. Um, so that's one way of, you know, fighting Certainly the languages that I work in between Spanish and English, I know that there's uh, many of this, the funding bodies tend to be very um, misogynistic. You know, I mean, I don't know the most recent Mexican pro trad, but the one before that, I think only nine out of the 60 projects were by women writers. So, you know, huge imbalance about who gets funded. And, um, and you know, it's important, I think, to try and fight against that. So one of the ways that I use my privilege as someone who's been in the field for, you know, and as a white male, even as a gay male, um, is to make sure that I'm translating at least one writer of color every year in whatever direction. And that's something where, you know, I have the luxury 
a privilege to do a sample, to spend time and energy knocking on doors until I, you know, find editor who's the right editor for that project. Um, so, you know, that's definitely one way that I use, you know, translation in an activist way. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, we've got time for, you know, one, what, a couple more questions probably. There's lots around kind of freelancing, um, kind of like at what, because <laughs> um, obviously it can be quite difficult and you can feel a little bit isolated as well. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about, um, uh, sorry, if it does it matter kind of like where you're based as well as a freelancer kind of, does you living in Madrid kind of has an impact on your work and the kind of the influence um, in projects that you are available to you, how, how, yeah, how that works out for you. Um, so I will say just before we go, uh, I'm easy to find on Twitter at Lauren Schimmel. That's the, the social media that I'm most on. So if there are questions that we don't get a chance to, I'm you know, delighted to keep you know, the conversation going uh, online after. Um, my moving to Madrid was a life decision that made it possible to do the things that I do. So when I, you know, I mean, I'm a third generation New Yorker, um, and I'm a New York Jew. There's a lot, you know, the sort of whole Woody Allen sort of mentality and, you know, the, the, the Yiddish kite, the, the humor that I get from my dad and stuff, that, that's all uh, very close to the heart. Um, but in New York, time is money. And if you're not making money, you're wasting time. And that's the idea. Uh, you know, when I first moved to Spain and I would take a book and go read in the Petito Park, Spaniards were jealous. Whereas in New York, it's like, you know, you're wasting time. You're not doing something productive unless it's, you know, a business book or something that you're getting out of, you know. So I had tremendous quality of life um, in terms of the decision to move here. The biggest one is I moved to a country with socialized medicine. So, um, you know, I would not be able to do what I do living in the States, I think, um, because just the cost of healthcare would be more than is um, feasible translating the kinds of books that I'm translating, if that makes sense. Um, I would recommend, you know, I don't think it's necessary to um, leave in a particular place to be a translator. I would say don't carry debt. Um, you know, I know that it was not good for my mental health when I, you know, switched from renting to um, having the mortgage, even though our mortgage was lower than the rent that I had been paying on my own. Um, you know, my husband and I bought the house together. Um, you know, I also, uh, you know, I'm married to a man. This is my second marriage um, in the US. Um, my first marriage and my second marriage were not recognized until the second or third year of my current marriage uh, in the US. So, you know, I mean, there's lots of reasons why my moving here was a good thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, those are lots of things that, um, you know, I think not having debt, um, you know, making decisions, you know, I made decisions about the kind of life that I wanted to have. You know, you can sort of see my big thing is, I've got lots of books. <laughs> That's the book section. Um, reading is important to me and having the luxury of time to read. Um, you know, don't have lots of fancy dinners and, you know, parties and alcohol and, you know, certain things like that. So, you know, those are life decisions that come up about what sort of life you want. And, you know, every person has to make those decisions. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we've almost finished. So I was wondering if you kind of like had any last um, little bits of advice to give to people that are trying to break into the industry. Um, like the biggest lessons that you've kind of learned along the way or biggest challenges, really? Well, I think, you know, more than the, you know, there's so much that we a lot of times in translation stuff, we we think about craft and craft is important and art is important. But publishing is a business. And I think that um, coming to terms with that <laughs> can, can solve a lot of heartache. Um, you know, I think that anyone has the right to write whatever they want. And when you want to start publishing, that's when you start having to make compromises or, or things so that it fits what is saleable. This is also something, though, that's different about um, self-publishing and that the technology is changing and is advancing um, so quickly. And, you know, like, I remember uh, being on a panel recently and um, one of the participants they were talking about they self-publish so they don't have to go through the cis heteronormative um, censorship that happens. Um, you know, they want to write their queer stories for a queer audience without making any concessions. And that is something that is possible today and is even possible, you know, to do in a translation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not 
this one I self-publishing, but because we didn't get funding for this translation, so I did it myself. You know, we did manage to get funding for uh, the Latvian, Slovenian, Lithuanian, and the Estonian uh, translations. But you know, it's the technology is at a place where you can just do things. You don't need to necessarily uh, get validation or permission from someone else to do things. You know, you can decide to you know contracting the rights adequately, but you know, you can do things yourself a little more, uh, you know, the, the zine, do it yourself, uh, punk, girl power, you know, there's lots of, um, you know, I, I came of age at a time when LGBT publishing was an important thing where we didn't need to have um, heterosexuals making decisions on what story, what of our stories about our lives was worth publishing or not, you know, so I mean, um, you know, I will also say that, that, you know, publishing is a business, there's lots of ways to fit into the business. Um, the more you learn about the business, the better it is for you um, to make sure that you're fairly compensated for the work that you're doing and that that is, you know, compensated over time. Um, so. That's great, Lawrence. That kind of felt like a moment of hope to end it on as well. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, Yes, we've been really enjoyed having you here. Um, and for everyone else that's joined us, um, we are running a couple more free events over the next couple of days. Um, so at tomorrow at 11 a.m., there will be a talk on translation as activism with Alex Valente, Catherine Halls, and Ali Reza Abiz. Um, and then on Thursday, we've got Jen, Kalija, Mina Kandasami, and Saskia Vogel discussing how translation informs their other creative practice as well. So thank you very much for everyone